So thank you. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Um, uh, Vance is a founder coordinator of Webheads in Action and LearningTogether.net. Vance has produced over 500 podcast episodes since 2010. He has over 150 publications, many available at his website, vanstevens.com, dealing with students using computers to learn languages and teachers learning to teach using technology by engaging in communities of practice and in participatory cultures. He has been a coordinator of TESOL Colias Electronic Village Online Evo, se Evo Sessions since 2003 and has co-moderated Evo Minecraft MOOC for the past seven years. He was, certain, he was recently awarded the 2019 Call Research Conference Lifetime Achievement Award. That's amazing. Uh, thank, you, thank you. Thank you, Vance, for accepting our invitation. And you are the first keynote speaker for today. And um, please welcome Vance. OK, well, thank you very much. Um... Uh, if you want to follow my slides, they're all online. In fact, I actually, just to kind of get my thoughts together, I wrote, I always write out a paper, uh, and then I go from the paper to the slides. So they're at bit.ly, I'm sorry, at bit.ly, B-I-T-L-Y. And if you put in VTCon 2021 Vance, you'll get the slides. If you can't remember which order it's in and you put in Vance 2021 VTCon at the bit.ly link, you'll get the paper. Uh, you know, actually, oh, maybe can someone, do you want me to put that into the text chat or uh, uh, can someone do it or shall I take? Yeah, to I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So well, if you want me to go back to it, just tell me. But anyway, uh, yeah, that's, yeah. that's how I, I do that with all my presentations. So any, if I don't say something or get confused or whatever, you can go back and read the, what I wrote down and that's what I meant to say. Okay, so uh, basically we're having a nice uh, chat with Jean here about uh, how she's dealing with COVID and, um, and how difficult it is. Uh, and I, uh, at the start of last year in January, I was uh, an English language specialist and um, I was in Thailand. Uh, I was giving uh, webinars on blended learning. Face masks were just starting to appear. Uh, we weren't that concerned about it. Um, I was there for several weeks, and at the end of it, I was wearing a mask. But um, I, I gave the the, the uh, presentations were basically on blended learning, and that is how to uh, have, let face to face teachers interact with their students through uh, online augmentation. And um, then after. I left there at the end of uh, January. In mid-February, part of the, the uh, job was to do an e-learning course. And um, I, so I, I did an e-learning course along the same lines. And that was about the time that COVID really hit everybody. So people, uh, teachers were getting quite confused. Uh, one of the participants in my course posted to Facebook, I wouldn't even know where to begin with teaching my classes online this semester. So people were really just then starting to grapple with it. Uh, there was a Thai professor, Ajarn T. Ajarn means professor in Thai. And uh, she uh, was taking on board a lot of the things that I was talking about. But a lot of people weren't because it wasn't uh, in January. It wasn't something that people were really having to come to grips with. It's just something about technology. But uh, the relationship between blended learning and going online is quite direct. And I've got a good colleague named uh, Jeff LeBeau who came uh, onto one of my uh, we webinars for the e-learning course. And all these uh, links are hyperlinked. So if you click on one, it will take you out to say, this is a recording of where he, uh, he talked to us. So you can hear what he had to say. So, um, sorry. The, the, screen share you know, comes over the tabs here. So anyhow, uh, if you follow the slides, and yes, you got it there. I might have posted the link. So if you follow the slides, you can click on links if you want to explore while I'm talking. So um, Jeff showed us, you know, Jeff has been a colleague of mine for a very long time. In fact, uh, we were doing webcasting together and he's 
uh, was doing uh, blogging, well, or, or podcasting, podcasting, going to conferences with a big video camera and interviewing people. He was doing that for a long time. And so when he went to Korea and he was working there, he did that with his students. He got his students into uh, webcam environments. Of course, it gets easier and easier nowadays. It doesn't really have to have a streaming server anymore. But um, he showed me his blogger blog where every, each one of those uh, tabs that you can see there is a part, a component to the course. So he had that online and because he had it there, he was able to share that with his department and he was telling us, he made me see very clearly the relationship between learning, uh, things trickling down to teachers and then they're having to get up and pick the balls up and run with them. So um, that brought us into what I call the new normal. I started a, a, a web page called Talon, Teaching and Learning in Isolation. It was uh, after, after the e-learning the e ended in uh, uh, sort of late February, I started, uh, I had that in my system. So I, I kept uh, uh, continuing with the same uh, uh, train, you know, trying uh, working with teachers and seeing what we could do to help trickle down our knowledge to teachers who were having to cope with uh, the pandemic. And there was some good news and bad news back then when the Zoom uh, released the uh, 40 minute time on its, uh, on its, uh, you know, on its uh, webinar client. And um, that made it pretty much the default uh, for Zoom, it, it also brought us Zoom bombers, for example, and we did a little webinar on that. Ike Philp was involved in that, I believe. And also, here's a here's a uh, video of how someone this one went viral. A student who's uh, who's not quite engaged in his Zoom course. Here we go. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Have you seen it before? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's famous. Okay, so anyway, let me close that window again. The, the screen share has dropped down over it. Okay, there we are. Okay, so um, so anyhow, as I mentioned, I started something called teaching and learning in isolation. I since changed that to teaching and learning in the new normal. Uh, my cat uh, actually did all the programming. Uh, I'm just kidding, of course. Um, but anyhow, that that was it, it. Was a series of 38 webinars that we're kind of getting teachers together who wanted, who had things to say to teachers uh, who were struggling with, uh, with coping with pandemic. And one of them, for example, was uh, Kendall Rowley, uh, got together with uh, the ITT, ITDI people. Uh, he had, uh, he was, uh, had some ideas on eight ways to energize your classroom. They're all things you could use in a face-to-face -face classroom, but we talked about putting those things online. If you click on any of these links, you'll see them. Um, Letizia Chinganotto and Daniela Cruturo, Cucurulo, sorry, um, gave a really nice webinar on uh, giving lots of practical tips on, um, oh, you've, you've seen this one probably, mobile not allowed in school, coming to school not allowed, use mobile. Anyway. Um, so they, that's a really uh, informative presentation. Another really interesting thing I did back at that time was working with Hannah Kamis, who uh, put on a sort of a grassroots teachers learning together summit. And um, it was all recorded, all online. So that one also is, uh, has lots of practical tips. And I believe, let me see if I can find Amani here. Okay. Uh, yeah. Control F. There we go. Okay. Here we are. So she's in there somewhere, I think. There she is. Okay. So she gave this presentation, and um, but there was all lots of presentations like this. All of this is recorded. So what I'm talking about here is teachers trickling down to. Uh, to other teachers. Am I presenting or is this a, is it just the, I've got to expand that out, there we go. I am presenting, okay. Yeah, so 
other, other things we did, more improvements on the new normal or teaching and learning in isolation. Lane Marshall, who's talking right after this, gave her uh, gave a presentation. One of the first presentations in Fallon was on SOFLA, uh, Synchronous Online uh, Flipped Learning Approach. I, I suppose she'll be mentioning that. There's an article that she wrote uh, in Tessa Lee J. Uh, this, uh, this thing right here has some interesting uh, tips for teachers. Or uh, One thing, if you look at the people who are interacting here, uh, there's Heike Philp in her, uh, uh, what's it called? Something rig, guard, anyway, we'll come to that. And then Graham uh, Stanley is there. And I'll just look and see whether another of the, the things we talked about was keep talking. I don't know if you've heard of keep talking. It's a bomb diffusion uh, program. <laughs> it's, well, I'll, I'll explain it in a minute. But anyway, uh, I'm, I like to have fun in my classes. And I, that's an acronym for frivolous, unanticipated nonsense. So that's uh, something I've been doing for a long time. Uh, Face rig, that's what it's called, face rig. So people were experimenting with things like that. Uh, there's Heike and her face rig guard. Now, uh, what we do, the, the manual for keep talking and nobody explodes. This is, uh, uh, what, what do you do? Let's see how to play, how to play. And then there's a little graphic here that shows you what you're supposed to do. So there, somebody is, has to defuse the bomb online, of course. And there are other people who have the manual that the diffuser can't see and they have to tell him how to do it. And the manual is very complicated. So they have to explain. And if he makes a mistake, the timer increases. And so basically it's keep talking and no one, uh, no one explodes. So, um, okay. There we go. Okay, so anyway, uh, these are the, some of the things that, as I said, Teachers are trickling down to teachers. Teachers are teaching teachers how to uh, how to uh, cope with emergency remote teaching. But we also emerged something called emergency remote conferencing, which is uh, we have a lot of webinars. Those of us who are doing a lot of webinars together, this is becoming second nature to us. It's not really a problem. But when an online conference, let's say TESOL, for example, put on a conference for 7,000 people, and it was their first time. And uh, it wasn't highly rich in uh, social presence in the, um, the, uh, frame, the COI framework, the community of inquiry, communities of inquiry framework. So it, it, it was a little bit dis, um, disjunct. You couldn't really, you couldn't really uh, meet people there very well. But there was one presentation there, uh, which was done by three ladies in uh, uh, Susan Gare, uh, Marjorie Wald, and Amy Pascucci. And they were talking about how they put on their uh, CATESL conferences, Cal TESOL conferences. And they have, they're on their way to do the fourth one. And they uh, compared what they were doing with the summer model. Their first conference in 2020, the spring virtual conference, was they did it on substitution. That's what TESOL did. They did a substitution model. They just tried to, they got something out there and uh, and that's a conference and people show up and okay. So the next one they did though, they uh, went augmentation. That is, they made some changes where the technology enhanced it a little bit. And then they learned what they could modify in the summer model. And the last one they did had uh, modification, modifications to it. I think they explained it in their presentation. And the one they're going to do, they, they want to redefine the concept of uh, conferencing. And Margie Wald said that she missed the human interaction. Oops, sorry about that. Go back. Okay. She missed the human interaction in exhibit areas in particular. In fact, she mentioned uh, Ayatel where they serve wine. Uh, and was recorded saying that. Okay, the exhibit hall is a great idea for a face-to-face -face conference, but we found it just doesn't work very well online. So now at the, uh, the last couple of days, I've been just paying a little bit of attention to what people are presenting. And one thing 
if if you want to do something in a, an exhibit hall, let's have a look at this site. It's called Verbella. I don't know if you've heard of it. I hadn't heard of it until today. And uh, basically, here's a conference hall. So it, that one, you get avatars and you get to walk around. I'm not sure how you relate to people. I just found out about it yesterday. Uh, I haven't really found much about it. But anyway, that's just something. And then also, uh, let me just close that. Okay, so also, if I go one more slide, this is something I learned about today at the VRT conference. Uh, Emma Abate gave a presentation on hubs, Mozilla hubs. And as I said, I've never heard about it till a few hours ago, but it's free and you can just download it in open rooms and create these virtual spaces, which um, I don't think it would scale up to a conference, but at least it's something you could do in a classroom, let's say. So, but I don't know if you're gonna, I can't vouch for it. I just, just learned about it and I stuck it in the slideshow, which I, as Ogden said, poems are never completed, only abandoned. It's the way my slideshows go. I just keep working on it until finally 30 minutes from now, I can stop doing it. Okay, so now suppose uh, in the substitution model that TESOL had in mind for its conference, you get on the escal you, you you get checked in, you get your badge, virtual badge, and you go up the escalator, and then you arrive in kind of nothing because it's um, well, there were about almost 400 recorded presentations and about 75 live ones. I went through the program and counted them. I didn't have to count the recorded ones. I had to just search and record it. They all came up, but I had to count the live ones because they were the green icon. There. So, um, a, one the presentation I did was recorded, but we we met in a text chat widget and met live with presenters. I described that uh, elsewhere. Anyway, I won't go into that just for time considerations. But basically. If you want to have uh, the social presence in a con conference, then we need to be looking at things that are going to uh, reimagine what conferences are like. So here's a blog post by Anders Pink. He just happened to have a picture of something that looks like when you come up to the top of the escalator in his blog. And over here on the right, it says exhibition. So if we go in there and let's see, Heike has already kind of done this. Let's just see what her, uh, conception of this kind of thing would be. Let's see, can I make this big? Okay, do you see it all on your screen, big? I think, okay, so now, Heike is uh, talking about uh, something she set up for a Hochschule, a Hochschule in Germany, who needed to get some online courses online. So she designed this uh, space in OpenSim. Now, I'm gonna let it play a minute, then I'm going to pop into another uh, another part, but here, here probably you've mostly experienced virtual worlds like this because, uh, but just in, for people who haven't or, or just might want to know kind of what it feels like, Heike gave a nice little illustration of what this looks like. So right now there's one person sitting in the hall and, but the hall can be full of people and there's a screen there. So it looks, you know, let me just pop out of that and go over to the next one. I'm just going to jump ahead in the video here. Okay, so if we look at what's on the screen, is my, uh, can you see the big YouTube? Okay. All right. So I'm purposely not playing the sound, but basically, so the audience can be interacting in some kind of uh, screen there in a hall. And also, but there's this extra, there's space around, you know, you can go outside and have a chat with people if you want or, or whatever. So again, this is open sim. A lot of you are, are familiar with that. Okay, so that's just uh, another way you can uh, you can deal with uh, the exhibit area that's not, that kind of works. What, what did Marjorie say about it? She said, oh, trying to make things happen without, okay, it's gotta be arrows. So she said, uh, the exhibit exhibition hall just doesn't work very well online. So we're looking, I'm just thinking, we're looking, looking at ways that we can make that exhibition hall work better online. So virtual worlds aren't really anything new, especially in conferences. And the SL languages started in 2007. There's a blog post by Mark Pegram here about the first one. 
And uh, I believe I was at that conference. Uh, Gavin Dudney started them and then eventually uh, Heike took them over. Heike is just in the waiting room now. So she's missed her, but she'll catch the recording. Okay, so uh, she she runs the virtual roundtable conferences with archives going back to 2009. So not only are these things happening, but they're also uh, recorded. Um, let's see. I'm, by the way, I didn't mention that if you click on a title here, you go, if you click on a slide heading, you go to the place in my write up where I describe that thing. So I'm waiting for that to happen. Okay, it's coming in. Here we go. All I wanted to do is I wanted to get one more uh, picture of a space that the virtual world's best practices for education conference was uh, was was doing. So this is this is one of, in 2015. This is the space they created for their uh, presentation hall. A, a sort of a forum and outside place. So it's, you know, subject to imagination. Um, okay, so this is another one of their virtual uh, uh, presentation halls. Um, so let's see. So what we're talking about now is not only, first we started talking about peers trickling down expertise to peers, but now we're talking about peers trickling up expertise to conferences so that conferences can find ways to um, involve us all in uh, redefined uh, ways of, uh, the, at the R end of the summer model. So over here, let's see, probably the best way to come here is to show you, uh, this is the TESOL EV, Electronic Village, component to the TESOL conference. I have to tell you a little bit about the TESOL EV. Uh, the call interest section started, I think, in 1984. Um, that year, we had an electronic. We had a we had a group of people with computers that got together and shared software. And every year since then, we've had a bunch of people with computers getting together in some event. Eventually, it became institutionalized in TESOL. It became the Electronic Village, and the Electronic Village then. 20 years ago in 2001, they created something they call Electronic Village Online. The idea was that not only do you meet face-to-face uh, -face at each TESOL conference, but you uh, can meet in January, February and uh, learn through peers and then go to the conference in March. So the Electronic Village has a separate stream from the TESOL conference. You, you have to pay for the TESOL conference, but not everyone knows that you don't have to pay for Electronic Village. It's all open and it's all online. Um, however, if you do pay for the TESOL conference, I, I mentioned I'd give a presentation there, I had to register. So um, I hung out really, just like I do normally, I hung out at the, at the TESOL conference. And there's, there's some interesting things here. There's a virtual world's demonstration part of the conference. And then I'm going to talk also about uh, Electronic Village Online, which is this part. Now the hike has arrived, we can talk about her session. There was a uh, one of these, oh yeah, the first one up here, Immersive Storytelling Virtual Worlds. That was her EVO session this time. And she also, and, and mine was EVO Minecraft MOOC. Actually, I was kind of invited here to talk about EVO Minecraft MOOC. So I will get onto that in a, in a few minutes. Um, so anyhow, the virtual worlds demonstration, uh, she gave an open sim and ELT presentation with Doris Molero and others, I suppose. And they were talking again about uh, storytelling in virtual worlds. So let me go back to the slideshow and see how we're coming with that. Okay, these are the things I just showed you on this slide. And Electronic Village Online, okay. Uh, I forgot to mention that we also have something called the best of EVO. Might have to hold on to Heike's uh, story, immersive storytelling for just a moment. But the best of EVO is uh, starting, I think I, I went back and looked, starting about 2008, we had presentations, live presentations at the face to face conferences where people who had given EVO, EVO sessions came to a room and talked to, told people about them. And we didn't do that again, maybe for another seven years, 2015, something like that. In 2016, let's see if I might have a slide on this. Yes, okay. 
in 2016 and 2017, we had something we called the Best of EVO, which was a live presentation at a live conference. Only the people who uh, were at the conference could present or would hear it, except that in all these years, we we're also streaming. Uh, Cal IS was, has been streaming out for uh, all this century. And uh, we've been uh, not really asking permission, but we've just been doing it and it's been accepted. No one complains. So we stream every year all the Cal IS events and you can find them all online. Again, this is done apart from the conference. Now in Chicago, uh, we were, this, this thing was maybe an hour in 2016 or 17. In Chicago, they gave us a space in the exhibit hall to give our, uh, our best BVO session. And they gave us an hour and a half or an hour 45 minutes or something like that. And again, we only had a handful of presenters there and, oh, and I was the one organizing it. So um, I made it hybrid and I got people to not only uh, to come in and we have all the recordings are here and uh, the archive is all there. So um, in 2019, again, uh, we did the same thing again in the exhibition hall, lots of times, actually a couple of different spaces, a couple of different times. We had we doubled the time and we got uh, everybody in the EVO, uh, almost everybody who presented in the EVO, must be at least 20 sessions, <clears throat> um, gave a presentation. Either they came to the conference, only five or six people, but the others all came uh, and presented online. Now, oh, go up to 2020 now, he saw conferences in Denver and it was canceled. Okay, so again, we we're planning, Jane Chen was helping me organize. We we're planning to uh, have a hybrid conference, a hybrid session. So we put on, we put it on anyway, at the right time in uh, April, early April when the conference should have been. We put on the, the session, recorded it all, we had it all uh, online and we streamed everything out. The only difference was there was not uh, it had no face-to-face -face component. So here you can see that we're sort of well positioned to be trickling up, to be informing uh, people at our umbrella conference what we're doing. Now, uh, as part of the Cal IS Electronic Village, uh, Heike gave this, uh, this open sim demonstration of her and Doris's um, language narratives, in this case, immersive, uh, immersive storytelling. Doris also has a, a space where she creates uh, historical mock-ups and uh, gets people in, in there to talk about them. So I'm just gonna play you a little bit here uh, to show you. This time I wanna have sound. Okay. Can you hear it? Well. This is um, a scene that I prepared and the theme was Harry Potter. So you, you can it? bring your students here and talk about the story or they can uh, use this and create their own stories. And that's what Threat Media is about. You had an original work that then in one medium, like in my case, virtually anywhere, is a podcast, is a series of audio series that is from uh, it's by Cambridge assessment. Uh, it's so beautiful, Dawn, the audio, that when I was listening to it, it was like I was imagining the scenes, okay? And I said, well, okay, we can have this, not only the audio, but <laughs> the in a virtual world. So that's what we did, and that's where everything originated. And then we got, I came across fan fiction. And fan fiction is something that the students do, you know, they love. Uh, changing things. They don't want the ending of a story, so they get a new one and they write it down and they... Okay. Uh, taking control of my presentation again. Okay, so if you want to if you want to hear the rest of that, you want to hear all of it, it's all recorded. It's, it's at this video. You can play the whole thing. Uh, I just wanted to play a little bit that kind of showed... Whoops, sorry. There we go. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to play a little bit that showed how... Uh, Heike and Doris had used the creativity and interactively, interactivity of open sim to uh, get students to, to tease target narratives and get the students actually to make uh, their own stories in virtual worlds, which is quite creative. 
Okay, so um, my thing in these events, I hope I'm presenting. Am I presenting still? Maybe someone yes. can talk to me. Yep. Yes? Okay. Um, I can't really tell if I'm in presentation mode or if I'm in... Uh, uh, I don't think you are in presentation mode. Ah, uh, that's what I was trying to find out. Yeah, okay. Oh, sorry. Let's see. I must be. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, yes. Okay. Uh, maybe I just had a reduced screen. So I have to manipulate my screen so I can see the tech chat and whatever. Okay. So anyway, um, let's see. Where were we? Let's see. Okay. We were just left there. Now, it, uh, I was. Uh, I gave a, a few talks on Minecraft at the uh, virtual TESOL conference. And one of them was called Preparing More Teachers to Engage Learners with EVO Minecraft MOOC. Because in EVO Minecraft MOOC, we deal with teachers. EVO, Electronic Village Online, is a teacher professional development uh, sessions that go on year after year. As I mentioned, there is like there, there are probably about 20 or I can't remember how many sessions, between 20 and 30. Uh, there are quite a lot of them. Um, and for this one, I uploaded a 10 minute version of my presentation to Flipgrid. And then uh, I made also a 20 minute version. This is the 20 minute version. I don't, let's see, I, what I do, I think I'll skip around and- Hi everyone, I'm- What it is. So Bobby is getting ready. Spiders are getting in position. She's, she's getting them. She's killing the Okay, uh, the reason I'm showing you this is what I did with this presentation was to take snippets of things we did in minecraft was, okay here's here here this is interesting now uh, the target. <laughs> this kid all right Finch is, his name, is showing me how to wire redstone in minecraft and yay whoa okay if you look to okay so anyway uh okay back in the presentation mode okay so so i made a 10 minute version of that and a 20 minute version now, what I did with this uh, was I, I believe that's the 20 minute version there. Oh no, that's, that's cued to the, uh, to where we find treasure. So from, from the, uh, these videos, I sort of categorized what people were doing. First of all, uh, people are being creative. Everyone's a builder. It's, if when you go to a sim space, uh, Second Life or, uh, you might not be able to do much there. It depends on what powers you have. But um, in Minecraft, everybody can build. Everyone can, uh, you know, create things. Um, it's fun. It's gamified. It keeps you in the game because it's, uh, it's constantly rewarding you for staying there. And it's game-based. That, that's important because teachers can modify the space. Um, it's community-based, has to be, because if you want to play Minecraft, you really need to find a community. And uh, students do that. Uh, we have a lot of evidence that's, that uh, learners, language learners are getting, are, are interacting in participatory cultures with other people in uh, their communities and learning language that way. It encourages communication, so many different directions. Students like to, like, like Haiku was doing with Second Life, uh, get students to create narratives, but you can get them to teach you like Finch was doing. He's an elementary school student. He was teaching me how to set up Redstone and make it work. Um, I was putting on the multimedia productions, but students often do that. Always having conversations with teachers and peers. Uh, there's a lot of research. Uh, people are reading sometimes books certainly blog posts, uh, listening to YouTube videos, comprehending what they're hearing, acting on what they're reading, what they're hearing, and also encourages formal learning. So what I did with that video is I had, this is number eight, I had 13 video snippets. And I, in, for each one in, this, in a blog, which is uh, the link to that, to the wiki, the link to that wiki is there somewhere. So this, the reasons for inclusion of each of these, which relates to these uh, affordances of Minecraft for learning, the reasons are all spelled out for each of these, these things. So this one, the one that we were just looking at is finding a treasure map. So uh, my wife, Bobby Bear and I 
uh, we found a treasure map in this area up here, I think. Must be where that is. And it pointed us, uh, where are we on the map? Okay, so it, oh, it pointed as we were up here, it pointed us this direction. Now that is actually to the south east. The map is facing north is that way, so that's the south. And so we know it's in this direction somewhere. We warped to another place and we took the map with us and this place showed us that the map was in this direction. So we found the area we should go into. Let me show you what happened. Okay. This is the map we found nope. on that shipwreck. Okay, whoops. Uh, and the, sh the map shows us, let's see if we can show where we're pointing. So I'm looking to the east right now. And uh, the, the map, that little dot in the corner of the map, the upper left corner, is where we are now. It tells us that we're way off the map. So to get more onto the map, we have to go more to the south and more to the east. Could be, let me see if I just walk this, now we, now I've arrived. if I can walk right on top of it. Okay, so apparently it seems like it could be right here. Maybe it's just at the edge. So maybe if we dig out the, so I'm sort of on top of it right now. Um, so maybe it's down below here. See where I'm right here? Okay, don't dig straight down. Uh, well, you'll, you'll be okay. okay. But what we'll do is we'll, we can dig here. This is right like in this, in this place right here. Yeah, maybe, maybe all around this area, but where we're standing, maybe we do a circle around us. And don't, uh, maybe try not to let water in. That's not already there. So don't cut away. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we how far down we can go. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Wait, wait, wait. See that? There it is. Yay. Yay, we yep. found it. All right. Okay. Shall we open? Let's open. Ah, I opened it. Yay. Oh, it's got diamonds. Cooked salmon. Emeralds. Let's Put empty salmon. this. Let's empty this sucker. Just take. Okay. How can I get out of this? Okay, there we are. Okay. Uh, let's close that. Back over here. All right. So that's uh, an example. In case you're not familiar with Minecraft, of how uh, people work in Minecraft, and then when you imagine doing this with students, you can set up. You could bury treasure and leave it there for your students to find, leave maps for them if you wanted. So there are various ways you could, sorry. Hi everyone, I'm Vance Stevens. I was the first official chair of the... Hi everyone, I'm Vance Stevens. I'll move off the slide, okay. Um, so, um, another panel I participated in was a virtual worlds panel. Uh, Randall Sadler, some of you might know if you're into virtual worlds. Uh, these other, all, People are all uh, moderators, co-moderators in EVO Minecraft MOOC. And um, I'm going to jump down to the presentation we did about our Best of EVO and Minecraft tour because we did a half hour Best of EVO presentation and followed that with a one hour Minecraft tour. And uh, in that one, I made this video, concatenated the two together. Let me just. Uh, uh, good morning or good evening. Skip around in it here. To competences and activities oh, and sorry, strategies. Uh, oh, they started with general uh, competences for me. That's, uh, that's actually. It's mom. <laughs> a special thanks to um, oh, as well okay. for your openness that's to growing our children. Episode. And my son adores so, everything Evo. 
So see that. I'll have to fix that later. But this, I think, is the video that I'm looking for. Yes, that's it. That's an hour long. No, it's not. That's not the video. It's the one we had. Account that is separate from my son's account and that I can act. Sorry about that. Okay. Maybe if I can go to the transcript. You see, I transcripted this video. So the link is in the transcript. It's quite, what I did was, this, this is the, the link I was looking for. Uh, I've got a problem in my slides there. And it's not, oh, let's see. Who maybe, oh, yeah, here we go. Okay, there it is. All right. That's it. Oh, I, I yes. can show you an example. So what we're doing here. A little bit. And um, this uh, answer any questions people have as we, as we move there forward. Is a, there is a good comment by Walton Burns in the chat, who says, as a teacher, it seems like the map would be helpful to keep track of students, though. <laughs> Maybe was that an idea, Aaron? OK, so what they're doing is they're talking about um, they're talking about the affordances of Minecraft. Uh, it's a great conversation. It was so good that I, I just had to write it all out. So um, I took it from the closed captions. I just put the closed captions together. It's been a nice amount of time on it. And uh, let's see if I, I'm looking for a place where Jane's talking about some of the books. Um, Last show. Okay, there we go. Here's a, a place where she's talking about some of the books that her kids are reading about Minecraft, fiction about Minecraft, or instructions about Minecraft. Uh, one of our first moderators also had a story about these books. His story is that uh, he was teaching in Turkey and um, the, his students, we're using the Turkish version of the red book, which is the easy one. Uh, he, his son was going to the school, but his son wanted to read it in English. So he went to an English bookstore and he bought the, this book in English. And then he uh, bought also the green one, which was only in English and more advanced. When his son took that book to school, all the students wanted a copy, but they had to go to the English bookstore and buy it. And so, uh, that's what they did. So it's just an example of the power of uh, uh, reading. There we go. Okay, so now what I did with this transcript was uh, I teased out some of the things that some more things that my, that very good uh, that Minecraft is very good at for learning. For example, making autonomous learners, and each of these links with something in the text. So like computer literacy skills. If you want to find out what the people here said about computer literacy skills in the transcript, you can jump down to that point. A little bit slow. But, uh, okay, so uh, this, her, uh, Mariana's sons didn't just learn to play and learn English. They started creating their own worlds of servers, videos, tutorials, and started programming and things like that. So they're learning uh, more skills than just Minecraft. Critical thinking, uh, how you have to organize your teaching as opposed to traditional teaching. Family and community. I say family and community. If community is very important, but a lot of our moderators bring their children into the game. Um, Motivation. Vince, yes? Uh, Vince, I'm sorry. We're going to start Q&A in a few minutes. Okay, I'm about done. Okay. I'm about done. I was just going to show you one surprising thing that I found. One thing was typing skills and understanding accented language. I wouldn't have thought of this myself, but um, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to let it go by itself. It should jump by itself. Yeah, okay. So typing skills. Some of the students were learning uh, about one of the, uh, Mariana's son went onto an international competition because he learned to type so well. Uh, Jane's son uh, became a very good typist. And then also accented language. I hadn't thought of that. Uh, Kamala said that people have so many accents and you have access to these accented languages 
And Mariana said, yeah, they have to understand there are different accents, not just two English language accents in the world, and this help, helps them learn English even better. I wouldn't have thought of that. Okay, so uh, I don't really- uh, Good morning or good evening, everyone, uh, depending oh, on the time zone uh, that you're in. Uh, uh, it might be that. very late for- <laughs> That was my video. Okay, the hardest, okay, so now then, what I've been thinking about is, can we do Minecraft as a venue for a virtual conference? And uh, I found a blog post that asked that question, but didn't really answer it very well. There was somebody here who um, has a site showing people how to, oh, that's the, I hit the wrong one there. Sorry about this, this one. This is uh, someone who shows you how to set up events in Minecraft. So there are instructions on that create and running player events. A lot of the events are, uh, these are these expensive instructions on how to do that or tips on it. Uh, some of the conferences are not really conferences. There, there was a conference in a Russian engineering school that did a conference in Minecraft, but uh, most of the stuff has been uh, musical events. Let me show you this one though, because it's kind of what I, um, have in mind. It's, I mean, it's just kind of like hike is here. Okay, there we go. Uh, you can't hear the music, right? I hope that's right. Okay, so imagine you're going to this virtual conference in uh, Minecraft and you have a blue door on the left and a purple door on the right. They don't seem to be marked, but you could mark this one that we're going to exhibition hall. Okay, so uh, you're on your way to the exhibition hall. You seem to be on that theme in this in this uh, uh, talk here, because it's not satisfying to Marjorie Wald. Uh, anyway, here we are. We're walking into the conference hall. Here it is. Uh, it's actually a dance floor down at the bottom, but let's pretend it's an exhibition hall. So there's lots of booths there. People are walking around. It looks pretty much like an exhibition hall in a normal conference. Okay, let me just turn that off. Okay, so um, one more time. You know, when I hit the, the slide, it plays the video. Okay, there we go. Now what I'm thinking about is, uh, this is my last thought for tonight. What about in the next EVO Minecraft 22? And I've just thought about this myself. I didn't have talked about it with anybody, but you know, we could have a one day conference as part of EVO Minecraft MOOC uh, 22. Okay, and there it is. It's already set up for us. So uh, we'll take it from there. And thank you very much from me. Don't forget that the slides are online and also the paper accompanying the presentation. And I suppose I can't really abandon this at the end of this hour. I've got to go and fix the little problems I found in the slides. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vance. That was fabulous. And having a conference in uh, Minecraft, that's really a great idea. Um, uh, I think we have some uh, questions here. And please, uh, for our attendees, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to drop them in the chat box. Um, so there is a question. Do you think Minecraft could be something we could integrate in, into our STEM programs? Absolutely. Uh, it's being used in STEM and CLIL. Um, it, uh, there's a good, a good place to go would be VSTE. That's Virginia Society for Technology and Education. They do, uh, uh, they have events once a month, the first Monday of every month at, uh, I believe it's nine in the morning. Uh, nine or 10 in the morning, I can't remember. But anyway, it's, uh, it's on a, a Monday, the first Monday of every month. VSTE, Virginia Society for Technology and Education. Uh, there, there would be a good resource for that. And you could probably Google Minecraft and STEM and you could pull up lots of stuff. But yeah, uh, STEM would, uh, there's so many uh, things that are built into Minecraft. Okay. So, Who is left out when you're using Minecraft in teaching? 
Deborah Healy's asked that. Who's, who's left out when you're using Minecraft and teaching? Let's see. Um, it's, well, when I'm uh, teaching using Minecraft, I haven't done that for a couple of years, but I did that in the UAE. Uh, the students were sort of interacting with me individually. I, I would, it would be an option for them. I mean, they might want to do, some might want to do something. If somebody liked Minecraft, they might make something in Minecraft and then explain to me how they make it, make screenshots, show it to me in a composition of some kind. So uh, I'm not sure I would like, maybe you could suggest, who do you think is left out? I mean, uh, if you put in a whole class there, there are classes, especially with young learners who uh, integrate this uh, regularly into their curriculum. And um, there's just a, a huge number of videos uh, showing what people do with it. Okay. How would you get started in Minecraft in a remote classroom? Is it free to sign up? No, it's not. I just did a presentation on that um, at the VRT WebCon. And I showed the difference in Minecraft. Actually, if you go to the VRT WebCon schedule and look for my name, Vance Stevens, you'll find my presentation and the recording and the, the PowerPoint and the write-up for that. So um, uh, it's not free. You have to, you have to buy it. Uh, there are two kinds. There's uh, Bedrock and there's Java. If you want to play with EVO Minecraft MOOC, you have to use Java. That's $28, something like that. And, but once you pay that money, you get a, you're actually buying a login. You have access then to all the software downloads. You can log on from any computer. Um, so um, lesson plans involving my, oh gosh, I'm missing some questions. Okay, so um, yeah, anyway, I, 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 I talked about that at the VRT conference. So lesson plans. Um, we talked a lot about that in that um, in the transcript of the conversation we had. We talked about the approach to teaching. Um, I have used lesson plans. You know, if you use Minecraft Edu, they're more Minecraft Edu is a Microsoft bedrock version of Minecraft, which is uh, you, you have to have Office three six five. But if your school has it, uh, that one is more uh, geared toward sort of shrink wrapped. Uh, but still creative, but they, they actually, so Microsoft, <coughs> Microsoft, uh, Minecraft Edu, they purchased Minecraft. So uh, their Minecraft Edu would probably give you some lesson plans. Um, negative comments in my, about Minecraft, bad components to it. Is it easy to monitor or control as a teacher? You know, funny thing, um, uh, Mariana was just saying in the snippet that is played that uh, Walton had said that his students, that they use this dynamic map and, and it was good for the teacher to see what the students were doing. So there are various ways you can control the students. Uh, bad, it depends on who's in your community. Uh, if you're in a bad community, I guess if you're on Second Life, they're probably I've heard about bad places, but I've never ended up in one. Uh, but if you stay in, uh, in the safe areas, uh, that, Minecraft happens on a server, uh, whereas like Second Life happens House outside, you know, it happens in the, in the internet, but Minecraft can be uh, it can be very controlled. It can be, I mean, it, certainly you get whitelisted on the server. Are we trying to get my attention to money? No, okay. No, no. Uh, <laughs> what like that? So I, okay. Um, Deborah has always has good comments. I see. I wonder. Uh, when there's something that is, can you speak? Can people can have their mics or? Yeah, anyway. sure, sure. Okay. We just have four minutes. Okay. Uh -huh. let, me, let me come up here. Um, okay. Yeah, basically, you know, I think it's a, it's a great tool, but one of the things I've been spending a lot of time on lately is, is this concept of critical call. Who's left out? Who's the affordances work for some people who can't do it. If you're visually impaired, that map is not gonna work, obviously. You know, you, you, have to, you have to create something that actually is universal design in order to make it work. And if teachers aren't prepared to do that, 
you're not going to get something that is universally usable. And that's, that's sort of the question that I have. What are the people, who are the people that are not temperamentally interested in creating things? What do you do with them if your whole class is built on, oh, we're going to all work together and create something? And how do you keep, how do you keep the boys from telling the girls how to do it? You know, as, not, not always happens, but so often happens. Just, just some thoughts. You should come and join us and uh, have a look around and, and experience it because, you know, uh, it, also it's not something that you would make everybody do. It's something that people would do. They might have various options for approaching things. Uh, one lady in Dubai gave a talk at one of the conferences we went to, I think maybe Toronto or something like that, where um, she said that she, her, she got into Minecraft because her students were going uh, at the break, they're playing Minecraft. She looks over her shoulder, over their shoulder. What are you doing? Oh, well, uh, you know, it's class time. We got to get back to class. Oh, can't we do this in class? She said, "Okay, you want to do this in class? I got a syllabus to cover. You tell me how this fits our syllabus because you know it's axiomatic that when people ask, is Minecraft in the syllabus? Well, you can't really say it is, but the syllabus is in Minecraft somewhere. So this the students had to write." A justification, which then she built into her class. So in that case, it had a student, uh, a student groundswell, and there could, of course, be people who aren't interested in that. But you find them other things to do. Every class is like that. Uh, whether you're, uh, you know, they, it could apply to so many tools. Um, but anyway, it's, uh, and, and especially in an online environment, you know, if you're, um, it wouldn't be something that. You no, know, I me, actually one of my dreams is to start a Minecraft. Uh, universe, start a server and just teach people on Minecraft. And that gets people who want to play Minecraft into your server so you don't leave anybody out. But if you're having a, a program where it's a diverse student population, I would definitely give people options. If you want to play Minecraft, they can do that. If they want to play Monopoly, they can do that. If they want to play chess, they can do that. Okay, so or whatever. Yeah. No, my granddaughter loves Minecraft. You know, let me merely say that it's, it's something. She'll that drag you into it. It, it, it has... It has an appeal, you know, but it's always a question of who's left out. My granddaughter plays Roblox. Monica just mentioned Roblox. I'm trying, she used to play Minecraft with us, but now she's, uh, now we're having trouble getting her into, uh, uh, into Minecraft because she's so into Mo Roblox. Maybe I could get her to show me around Roblox. I've, I've thought of that. She should talk to my granddaughter who's also into Roblox. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get them together. Bring them into Minecraft and we'll put them together. Thank you so much. I just want to say something that my son is uh, like one of the best students in his class. And he's like one of the, the students who likes to do Minecraft and Roblox. So, and he one day he looking, he's looking forward to be a Roblox programmer. <laughs> so it's one of the things that really inspires the kids when you see them do Minecraft and Roblox. And thank you so much, Vance, for this great uh, keynote uh, speech. Uh, it was really fabulous and really uh, great. And um, the, the, there's much work like you've ha you have like talking about great work and much work in a very succinct uh, manner. And I really appreciate your hard work with other peoples in the evil. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Helene Marshall. Yeah, I'm gonna make you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.